And I must uh, begin this panel by saying that we have some uh, changes. And uh, um, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Agnieszka Halemba couldn't come uh, because at her university, the University of Warsaw, the, uh, they have some very important meeting and some of her colleagues who were here yesterday couldn't come um, either. So um, I will be chairing this. Uh, panel, and we will start uh, by um, uh, like unusual <laughs> way because uh, uh, yesterday uh, during our panel, where the religious actors were presented, uh, one of our um, uh, guests couldn't come, and it was uh, it was a, a mufti from the Union of Muslims of Poland. And uh, today we have a, a representative of this union who wants to say a couple of words to us. So we will begin with uh, uh, this um, small uh, speech of uh, Marek Moron, and then we will come to our panel. So, so please, please, Mr. Moron. It is my privilege and honor to convey the best greetings of the Mufti of Poland, His Excellency, Mr. Tomasz Miśkiewicz, to all the participants and organizers of this conference. The Mufti is very grateful for receiving the invitation to this conference, but regrets his inability to attend the sessions of our conference and sends warm greetings to all of us. The Mufti is aware that the initiative of the Muslim Re Religious Union of Poland, which was founded in 1925, right, uh, uh, initiative of prayer for peace and justice, which is annually held at the village of Bochoniki, uh, has met with interest of many people. It is indeed one of a number of events and formulas of joint approach of Polish Muslims and Christians to many important issues of our times. We also have been receiving questions on, and I quote, how the history of 20th century influenced Islam. Islam was one of the factors influencing the, so to say, story of 20th century, and vice versa. It has been influenced in its social and cultural aspect by factors and processes never encountered in earlier history. We therefore seek the continuation in 21st century of these processes started in 20th century of strengthening the role of Islam as contributor to the efforts of humanity in dealing with these unprecedented challenges of now and times to come. God willing, we shall be successful in this. Thank you very much for, Thank the, for you. the time. Thank slot. you for Thank your you. talk. Thank, Thank you. you. So now we are coming to our panel, and this is the panel Secular versus Sacred, the uses of religious language in secular memory projects. And we have a um, commentator, uh, Professor Andrzej Spuczynski, who is professor working in the Institute of Political Studies in Polish Academy of Sciences. Since 70s, he is working on the questions of social memory, politics of memory, transformation of uh, contemporary culture, um, nation and the sense of nationality. Uh, he is the chief editor of the series Contemporary Polish Society Towards the Past. Uh, he is an author of several books on memory, among uh, others, Przemiany obrazu w przeszłości, inni wśród swoich, wobec przeszłości, pamięć przeszłości jako element kultury współczesnej. So, and uh, we have our panelists here, uh, Professor Rasa Blukaite, Professor Magorzata Głowacka Greiper, Brandon Humphreys, and Ekaterina Klimenko. And we will start with Rasa um, Balokaite's uh, presentation called Non-Theistic Catholicism Telling National Suffering Through Catholic Discourses. 
And uh, I will just uh, shortly present uh, our panelists uh, like, uh, when they appear. And now about uh, uh, some words about Rasa Blokaita, uh, who is an associate professor in society in the Department of Philosophy and Sociology Critique uh, at uh, Vatautas Magnus University, Lithuania. Her scholarly interests include Soviet and post-Soviet societies, Soviet colonialism, societies in transition. Uh, she was visiting a Fulbright scholar at uh, Berkeley and uh, a visiting fellow at Potsdam Center. Uh, so, uh, and she has uh, published intensively on these questions of memory in Lithuania. So, welcome, Rasa, please. Right. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you for. Uh, inviting me to, his, to this conference, and it's my pleasure to be here. And yeah, my topic somehow will continue. I'm sorry, first, how much time do I have? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Thank you. So my topic will somehow continue along the same lines as, as uh, the keynote speech earlier this morning. And I'll speak about um, what I call non-theistic catholicism in Lithuania. What I mean by non-theistic Catholicism, that religious symbols are applied in everyday life, incorporated in everyday life, and that they primarily have a value, not religious value, but they have quite a different value. And they represent something else. This is just one photo. It's Hill of Crosses in Chile, in, in Lithuania. It's just very general. It's just to illustrate the uh, importance of Catholicism in Lithuanian kind of cultural tradition. Lithuania, out of, uh, only one of the 15 Soviet republics, was have has had Catholic majority. And especially during this kind of Soviet years, the Catholicism became kind of one of the fundamental aspects of. Uh, anti-Soviet opposition. But this is the Hill of Crosses originated, ha has originated much earlier, and I just provided it just as an example. But my topic is, the core question is like, that during the fall of the Soviet Union, we have witnessed a revival of Catholicism, very, very strong revival of Catholicism. And many social and political science, scientists came surprised, how is that possible that, you know, educated citizens of the modern industrialized secular state so easily like you know fell into this religious practices rites and rituals walking prayers crosses flowers and so other and so on and my argument is that Catholicism was a productive tool for coping with the, the traumas of the Soviet period. And it offered a very uh, convenient frame of, uh, kind of cognitive frame of interpretation of what happened to people in, during the Soviet period. And um, for those who are interested in studies of totalitarianism, you must be familiar a bit with Hannah Arendt's writings about indirect violence of totalitarianism. So just a brief comments about traumas of the Soviet period. The, the traumas are listed, major traumatizing events are listed here. So it's Soviet occupation, Nazi occupation, Holocaust, second Soviet occupation, deportations, partisan war, forced collectivization, persecution of the dissidents, military service in the Soviet army, Army experience of the of China, Soviet war in Afghanistan, Chernobyl. This, it just, uh, you, you know that pretty much. But my point is that Hannah Arendt knows that totalitarianism works on a mental level in a very particular way. What is traumatizing, not the event itself, but it's traumatizing that you are not allowed to talk about the event. So it's a ban on language or silence, conspiracy of silence, that horror becomes unspeakable. Whatever the soldiers who came back from Afghanistan or the deportees who came back from, from Gulag, they are not, not allowed to share the experience. They are not believed, they are not listened, they are not respected, they do not receive compassion. So they are kind of re-victimized again, and it affects the family dynamics that like children see that the dad is not happy or grandfather is, acts like crazy. And they do not know what happened. They feel that something horrible had happened, but that is kind of unspeakable. And it's like, she calls it like, it's like really, really horrible condition, that it's not the event itself, but what happens after the event. 
And this is kind of a little bit, uh, uh, I'll make some excursions to into another field like Sandra Butler. She's a feminist from California and she wrote a book about incest in the, as a family secret and she calls it conspiracy of silence. So I found it very similar, like two very different authors, Hannah Arendt writing about totalitarianism and Sandra Butler writing about sexual violence and incest within family. But both came to very similar conclusion. This is like secondary violence, ban of language, inability to speak. The victims are made pretend like nothing happened, to live like it, it had never happened, to carry the trauma within themselves and to act, act against themselves, deny their own senses. Like you live like it, it has never happened. Even if you feel, feel pain, you suppress the pain, you don't trust your own emotions and you kind of uh, internalize what is the, your official uh, official role? Like you you are expected to act like a good daughter, or like you are expected like uh, to act like a good citizen, and you suppress your own natural feelings, and you internalize this outside impo uh, this role out imposed from outside. So indirect violence of totalitarianism, according to Arendt, is that making violence in, uh, invisible and making horror unspeakable. So ban of language that is real reality, functioning reality is eliminated. Like it doesn't matter what happened to you. It doesn't matter what you feel. What matters is like a, a ideological version of reality imposed upon you, that you have to accept this ideological version of reality. You are happy, you are okay, bad things never happened to you. And there's several examples of, um, I'll just check, check the time. Uh, there are several examples of this indirect violence of totalitarianism and silence surrounding the families. This is, comes from my interview that the family learned only about uh, deportations when the depo deportees came back. And one woman told that she got married a form to a former deportee. They dated for a whole year, but he never mentioned some Siberia. And actually the things came out to the daylight when the Soviet Union collapsed. So they got married, they got two children, and she never knew about the past of her husband. So imagine, like, you have breakfast every day with the same person for so many years, and you avoid the topic so actively that it never comes out. So you want to protect your children, you want to protect your spouse, you want to protect yourself, and you simply do not talk. Another episode is like the, this also kind of relates with the sexuality. It's, uh, it comes from a, a book by Ramonete in the memories of Ramune Yurkovene. Imagine uh, the Ramune was born in a family, the Portis family, or a family with a bad political past. So there were a lot of issues in a the family they have been hiding from public. And there is an interesting episode. They lived in a small town or village. And children have been playing unattended, what is typical in small towns. And one day, a stranger, a man, adult man, with a black leather jacket and a car came into the, into the town. And he approached the children and said, like, I can give you some candies, and maybe you want to have a ride with my car. And the car was an attraction, and children have been enthusiastic about it. And the, the man has chosen Ramune for a, uh, for a car ride. And he gave her a car ride, and he started here he, c questioning about her family, what your parents took at home. And she, she said, like, she was so hesitant. She felt so bad, like, she kind of revealing family secret, secrets that she felt like, you know, violated in a way. And when she, she didn't tell much, she came back home and she was so afraid and embarrassed by, by what happened that she never told to her parents in a long term. And finally, after several months, she told to her parents that about this like, stranger in a black jacket on a car. And the parents have been first afraid. They said, we hope that you didn't tell him anything. <laughs> And it's not, not about not the fear about sexual violation, but the fear that the family secrets will be revealed. Okay, I'm able to stop at this. And my point is that after the fall of the Soviet Union, all these repressed memories, all this pain, uh, unarticulated pain, all these repressed memories, all these bad experiences that have been never talked and discussed, but somehow felt, but never talked or, or articulated, came to the daylight. And 
my question is like how do, how do people talk about something that they have no concepts no names no vocabulary they don't know even how to how to frame this experience i mean in western europe in western democracies there was a long story about like shock shell post traumatic stress disorder intergenerational violence grief depression something and so forth and so on so this entire debates entire discourse about what is trauma what constitutes trauma how you go through trauma how does it affect you how you fight and freeze response and so other and so on and people are educated and socialized in this discourse and they know how to name their own feelings and their own emotions and what happened in post soviet bloc and particularly in lithuania and my point is that probably catholicism offered a very convenient frame of reference very convenient kind of cognitive scheme when you can talk about your experience using familiar concept jesus suffering redemption atonement sin uh, resurrection and so forth and so on and my uh, there was an interesting lecture by american scholar denise torp she she gave the lecture at vitotos magnus university and her lecture was about all saints day in 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 lithuania in soviet lithuania all saints day is on november 1st and it's typically a national holiday when you pay respect to the dead and typically all over lithuania there is a traffic jam and people travel thousands of miles to hundreds of miles lithuania is small <laughs> 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 to attend to attend the cemeteries and to, they put a lot of flowers they put a lot of candles and nowadays this this tradition received a lot of criticism like some people ask like why are you doing this like to show that you love you if you love someone show your feelings when the person is alive and the new story explained that is especially during the soviet period this uh, all saints day celebration of all saints day was kind of consolidated and grew very important because it gave the families the opportunity um to gather to to uh, to, uh, to, um, to come to one place to spend time together and just be sad without saying anything kind of feel the lost feel the grief without speaking without saying anything is it clear what i mean feel, feel the sadness and you know without articulating without using any words so for me it was a starting starting points to starting point to explore and to research what i have seen in so many places in lithuania and so many monuments state initiated or partisan monuments or church initiated or just directed by random citizens incorporating different religious symbols and in interpreting them in a very different ways so my point was that probably the the catholic symbol became in catholic narrative in general became as a as a frame as a as a language to speak about trauma not the language to speak about our fate not to, not the language to speak about catholic values as such about divine nature of virgin mary or, or jesus or something else but just a, a way to express the feelings that people didn't know how to express in some other ways and yes <laughs> So my point is that Catholic frame of reference offered kind of grammar of representation, ready-made narrative, and you can speak about your sufferings. And now I'm going to uh, to go to review several several memorials. As you see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six or seven of them, but there are much, much more. And how to incorporate different Catholic symbols and commemorate losses and sufferings of the Soviet period. These are memorial crosses to defenders of Lithuanian independence who died on January 13 when it, during uh, the, the uh, military encounters with the Soviet armed forces in SOC. This is articulated in a very traditional religious symbols. And this is the location. It's also kind of strange because this, you have traditional wooden crosses in a location there's near TV tower. And this, the general general memorial is a little bit bigger. There are some other monuments, but this is the the, uh, the location as like as the founding, as the starting point of, uh, of everything. Although it is known that some of the people were not Catholic. Some of them, one one woman who died was a tatter. But again, the use of religious symbol this, as a pain or something. This is just the beginning. And yes, this is again, it's like I'm very ironic. You have this modern TV tower and you have very traditional wooden crosses. And 
but to give you broader feeling, this is an uh, uh, this is a recorded experience of how the person uh, how the person experienced the events of January 13, when someone has died, someone was murdered, a young man was murdered, and as you see, the person I don't know who is the author, the person said, "I kneel it by the murdered young man, as if uh, as if he were my son." I started to cry. An innocent blood of heroes scattered as the millions of stars. He has enlightened our souls wrapped by the gloomy dusk with the new dawn of resurrection. And it's preparing our hearts to the example of Pelini's sacrifice. It's a long story, Pelini, I just kept it. If the aggression continues, our parliament, its militia, and people guarding the parliament are ready for this sacrifice. So it's kind of sacrifice, like a sacrifice of Jesus in the redemption. It's like a, you know, and it's like a, this teleo teleo teleological aim that's re-establishing Lithuanian independence. Another another case is a hill cross, hill of crosses, not a hill of crosses, actually just kind of kind of forest of crosses, in a, in corners in my in my place where I live now. It's near. Uh, it's near. Uh, okay, it's near six so-called six fort. But it's in a, in a place. The former was, was a monument, Soviet monument, just the Soviet tank. And after the tank has been removed, people started spontaneously erecting crosses in this location. This is not how the place looks like now. You can see a small statue of Virgin Mary and variety of crosses. And there are crosses for deportees, crosses for the young men who died in the Soviet army during performing their duties in Soviet army. Uh, there is monument to aborted children. There are monuments to people who exiled to the United States. Uh, this is yeah. This is statue of Virgin Mary, and this is conglomeration. This is for nations who recognize, for states who recognize Lithuanian independence following Soviet Union, and uh, this is uh, for Iceland for recognition of Lithuanian independence, for Denmark for recognition of Lithuanian independence, in memory of Stasis Lazaritis, who was American presidential candidate in in Lithuania in 93s for uh, victims of maddening tragedy. It was a border control post was attacked by, I guess, by Russian forces in 1990s, and several young men has died. And as you see, this, people use use the use the religious religious language like they have no other language. I mean, uh, erecting cross for Iceland for recognition of Lithuanian independence, like it's it's like very weird way, but it sounds like people are lacking in the heads and the minds. They have a total lack of alternative vocabularies of how else you can speak about this, this, this experience. And this is Noyoy Vilna train station memorial, train station memorial to deportees. And as you see, this was the major station where the people were deported from Lithuania. And as you see, the, 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 the burden, the deportees have suffered, suffered is equated to the cross, like a heavy cross, they have heavy, it, and it's like a I mean, symbolism is clear. I just have I've been told I have three minutes left. This is a monument to Taurus. So I think now I said my theoretical premises, and I'll just be short in interpretation, uh, because I think it's clear. This is a monument to anti-Soviet partisans who fought against Soviet authorities in Mariampoli during post-Soviet years. As you see, here is a probably body of the partisan, very kind of... Uh, symbolic representation of the partisan's body, and it looks a little bit like Jesus crucified on the cross, and the body, it's, a, it's right here, right? Entire monument resembles the cross, and uh, this is, again, it's neither, neither, neither the Jesus nor the partisan, it's not, not, not clear what is represented. The body on a cross incorporates some oak leaves with reference to the forest where the, you know, partisans have lift, so to speak. Another case is interesting. It's a partisan team, uh, team park established by a priest, by Monsignor uh, Svarenskas in 96. He, in, he, somehow he inhabited or inherited huge forest territory, and he established a park in memory of anti-Soviet partisans. And in a park, there are, um, I don't know how many, it's like 
10 or 16 crosses, so each cross for each partisan troop. And again, it's clear use of, of religious religious symbols. I mean, but the partisans have been not, not fighting for Christianity, for Catholicism. They have been fighting for Lithuanian independence, for political values, for national self-determination. And there are several examples. Another, my, my favorite case, as a Church of Lithuanian uh, Martyrs consecrated in 2006. The Church of Lithuanian Martyrs, the, here is the church, and there is an alley of, uh, I don't know, alley surrounded with statue, and statues def they represent different sufferings, uh, child aborted children, partisans, mothers of partisans, deportees, victims of KGB, victims of Chernobyl, and so father, and so on. And it's the kind of, here is an interesting way how people link Catholic symbols with the uh, with national, this is very beautiful at, at, at you know, a certain part of the time. This is a use, a interesting use of symbols. This is a statue of Virgin Mary, and this is, instead of the heart of Virgin Mary, you see something interesting. It's a map of Lithuania. So it's not the traditional sacred heart of Virgin Mary, but it's map of Lithuania violated by, by knives. Another, it's a victim, I think it's the, to the mothers of partisans. This is a monument to victims of KGB, and you see this is a clear incorporation of the barbed wire into the monuments. Not, not even the, the, the Jesus, he has not the traditional uh, crown of thorns, but it's, he has this barbed wire around his head. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, on this element, on this element, the major monument, there is also elements barbed wire with a with a clear reference to political repressions. Here is another mem memorial to Lithuanian partisans, and uh, this also in Kaunas and Petrašiūnai, and it's very interesting. Again, one lay representation as a Virgin Mary with a with her son Jesus Christ dying or taken away from the cross on his hand, da dead or dying. If you look, it's again. Interesting choice of symbols. Uh, and if you look at the close, closer at the faces, they're kind of de individualized. It's kind of, they are not even a, a Virgin Mary and Jesus Christ, but very symbolic figures. They have no faces. Literally, for me, my interpretation is that this de individualization means that everyone can identify with. It's like, a, instead of the face, it's just like a blank, you know, blank space. So everyone can identify with. So, I mean, this symbolically, there is a very strong, uh, very strong connotations, like, like mothers of partisans who are compared to the Virgin Mary, and the partisans them, uh, who, Virgin Mary, who, uh, who's, who lost his son, who died on the cross. And the partisans are kind of at a symbolic level. I compare to the Jesus Christ Himself, uh, who sacrificed His life for you know for. And what is sacred in non-theistic uh, non Catholicism? So as, as it has been said earlier, the Durkheimian concept of religion refers to religion as a worship of collective value. And there is, it has been mentioned already: civil religion and political political religion. And so my point is, is that probably people, many scholars ask, like, how people, educated people, they have, you know, nuclear power plants, they, they, have, they have been astronauts, they have been flying to the moon, and how they fell so easily into this kind of emotional, religious rites and worship, collective worship, crosses, erecting crosses, singing songs, praying. Okay. Yeah. And my point is that, my point is, just 30 seconds, my point is that what people are worshipping, they're not worshipping this catalytic, catalytic ideals or divine ideals. They're probably paying respect to their own grandparents, brothers, parents who suffered or who died during the Soviet years. And just last 30 seconds, in Skemonis, there was uh, there is a legend, there's a legend that young woman has seen a Virgin Mary. The one more woman, young woman was taken away immediately, tortured by KGB. Later she married a KGB officer. And uh, <laughs> But the legend was is, was prevailing, and it's still prevailing. And the spot became very popular for people to, to you know to, to gather, to pray, to erect crosses, but during the Soviet years and during past Soviet years. And during my field work, I met one woman in this location, and we have had a long conversation. And finally, at the end, I said, like, 
she was cultivating the garden, small garden there. And finally, then they said, like, yeah, but like, do you really believe that you know this, the Virgin Mary has appeared to a regular peasant woman? And the woman said, and that the place is sacred, that it has some healing powers. And the woman said something very interesting. This is the young woman who claimed that she's seen Virgin Mary. This is the location. And the woman said, very interesting. The place is sacred for us, not because of the Virgin Mary. The place is sacred for us because we as community experience together for our prayers, for our sufferings, and for our solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Magorzata Gowatska Graper from University of Warsaw. Uh, she is a sociologist and social anthropologist and assistant professor at the Institute of Sociology. Her research interests include social memory, ethnic tradition, contemporary developments in ethnic identity, and minority group activism. And the uh, topic of the talk is uh, martyrdom in the local communities, interplay between religious and secular language in the memorial project in contemporary Poland. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me for this conference and um, putting my uh, presentation to this panel. I think I will be very in line with this topic raised by, uh, by you in, in a few minutes. Uh, I want to present you uh, uh, ethnographic material from our research project uh, headed by Susanna Bukumiu. A milieu de memoir in Eastern Europe uh, in the Polish case. Uh, the empirical material uh, we were collected uh, during three years. Uh, uh, well, uh, in the interviews with inhabitants uh, of uh, small villages and, uh, and towns. Uh, also interviews with main actors of memory observation on local celebration, also ar archival work. And uh, when you investigate the Polish cultural landscape, uh, you will clearly see the diversity of forms and uh, remembrance narratives. However, it uh, quickly becomes apparent that religious language maintains a continuous hold over both local and state national uh, history remembrance practices. And our main focus of the project was the predomination of religious language in the Second World War commemorative practices. And um, during communist time, the communist authorities attempt to create a secular, not religious language for commemorating the war. But despite the construction of memorial complexes and, and smaller secular memorial markers, uh, it is sites of memory of a religious nature that predominate in today's cultural landscape in Poland. And moreover, after 1989, uh, there was a clear turn towards religious language of commemoration, also on the state, uh, state level. Uh, and I would like to present the three cases. Uh, when the uh, local commemorations and national ones uh, coll uh, collide or, or clashes, or sometimes they are very in, in, the same, in the same line. We have chosen uh, three uh, villages and, and small towns uh, when uh, uh, important events during the World War II uh, happened, and the local community commemorated it in their own uh, very traditional religious way. But uh, in, not, not so uh, long ago, in uh, 2000 years, the state came uh, with the idea of building the national memory projects. First project is a mausoleum of the martyrdom of Polish villages. Uh, so the uh, Poles are as, uh, victims, are the forgotten victims uh, from the villages. Uh, second is Jedwabne, not only in Poland, but I think worldwide known uh, example of, of Polish uh, antisemitism and Polish guilt. So Poles are as perpetrators in, in this fact. And Markowa, quite the opposite, uh, the Museum of Poles rescuing Jews during the World War II. So Poles as uh, heroes in, in this, this matter. And first is uh, the village of Michniu. Uh, on uh, 13 July on um, 1943, uh, 
the uh, Germans uh, entered Michniów and murdi- murdered everyone they came across in the villages' uh, buildings. Uh, all homes and buildings that remained were burned to the ground, and over two days, uh, 204 villagers died. And the commemoration of Michniów pacification has a long tradition. Uh, stretching for the first uh, songs written uh, immediately after uh, pacification. Also the books, articles, uh, te- also uh, museum presentation. And the narrative of these events is expansive and rich in details. And it was centered and propagated through both traditional, so-called traditional means, uh, suited to local rural community, and also so-called modern methods like um, building museums and uh, historic, um, building historical narratives. And in 1979, the General Commission for the Investigation of Nazi Crimes first came up with the idea of creating a mausoleum of the martyrdom of Polish villages. Uh, but it took many years, and uh, um, in 2008, a new design for the mausoleum was presented, which was created at the Nizio International Design Architectural Studio, which is, in fact, responsible for many memorial projects in, in Poland. And in April um, 2010, the first stage of the mausoleum's construction began. You, you can see it. Uh, uh, but funding shortages have uh, meant that, uh, uh, that the mausoleum's modernization is yet to be completed. Uh, all that has been erected is a bare building. There is no, in fact, uh, this museum at the moment. And the construction of the modern mausoleum provoked many controversies uh, among local societies. These disputes lay bare how deep the differences are between national and local conception of what commemoration actually means. Does it mean to commemorate the the death? And uh, one point of disagreement relates to conceptions of the religious aspect of commemoration. It is exemplified by despites centered around St. Margaret's Chapel, Uh, this this small chapel, Uh, uh, besides the collective graves. It was built in the uh, 50s. And remembering the dead is mainly viewed as a religious duty. And the local community believe that religious rites are the best way of honoring the memory of their dead. And this does not preclude the existence of other secular forms of commemoration, but this can never replace the religious ones. And the creators of the current design for the mausoleum thought about religion in, I would say, a religion uh, unreligion matter. Um, if it's the term of a general practice conducive to reflecting on human fate. And this mode of thinking was expressed in the design for the creation in the first room that the visitors enter, a place of silence. Uh, it was to be a place or reverent reflection where services and prayers of various kinds uh, could be held. And it was in this place that elements of the dismantled chapel of St. Margaret were to be installed. However, the villagers interpreted this project as an attempt to divest them of a sacred space. And memory of the Mignuf pacification is deeply embedded within the village's local community. Uh, But the generation, of course, that remember the war from their own experience are slowly passing away, so it is uh, becoming crucial to prepare a form of commemoration uh, that uh, will guarantee that the stories about the village's pacification survive um, into future generations. And there is therefore a need to use a language that appeals to the youth of today. And however, memorial actors from Michniów and the surrounding uh, region have also set themselves more far-reaching ob- objectives. They want Michniów to become a center of memory of the fates of Polish villages during World War II. E- an enterprise of this nature requires the assistance of such institutions as, the, for example, Peasants Party, Polish Peasant Party, and the Polish state. But this means changing the language used uh, to narrate the past. 
and uh, this new language is accepted uh, locally in both domains while it does not interfringe on traditional commemorative methods of a strictly religious nature and what have been developed over, over many years. And these traditional and modern methods of commemorations function in parallel in separate sites. This is a, a project. And within the village space. And one such site associated with traditional methods of commemoration is the chapel and the victim's grave, while modern methods are practiced at such sites as the mausoleum building. It is, it is only a project, it, it was not finished yet. And uh, however, there are also parts of the village space that are shared between them. And this is um, uh, this uh, uh, forest of crosses. You, uh, each cross uh, symbolizes uh, one pacified uh, village from the, uh, during the war. Uh, and the Pieta, uh, a mother with uh, a dead son, which uh, renders human suffering in the language of, of Christianity. Uh, and the second example is, uh, is Jedwabne. Uh, in Jedwabne, in uh, year 2000, uh, when Jan Tomasz Gross published uh, in Polish uh, a book titled Neighbors, the Destruction of the Jewish Community in Jedwabne, Jedwabne uh, was transformed into a globally recognized uh, symbol of the Holocaust and of a symbol of Polish antisemitism. And Gross' book, which tells of a crime uh, that the Polish inhabitants of uh, Jedwabne committed against their Jewish neighbors uh, in 1941, suddenly uh, first the inhabitants of a small town into the very center of a national debate on Polish-Jewish relation during uh, World War II and Polish attitudes uh, towards the Jews in, in general. And the national debate centered around the crime in Jedwabne and the construction of a memorial commemorating the murdered uh, Jews became a cultural trauma for Jedwabne's inhabitants uh, that influenced how they uh, remembered that crime. And the local residents decided to counter the effect of this trauma by undergoing so-called monument therapy. So Jedwabne's inhabitants responded to the erection of a national memorial in, in their town by erecting or restoring other monuments, alluding to the war period. And uh, however, the Jedwabnians are the community uh, which life is focused around uh, a parish church. It, and uh, around um, church holidays and rituals. And that explains why the only monuments in Jedwabne that have a social function consist of religious elements. Uh, of course, our knowledge of uh, how many of the Jedwabnian Jews functioned before the national debate um, in the beginning of uh, 2000 years is fragmentary. But there are some research by Marta kurkowska budan and, and film by Agnieszka Arnold that uh, actually uh, went to Jedwabne to speak with uh, local residents uh, in person and observe the process that was transforming their, their attitudes. Both of these researchers showed that uh, no matter how difficult it was for them, many Jedwabnians wanted to speak about what uh, had happened in, in 1941. But uh, the situation rapidly changed after the publication of Gross' book. Uh, as the national debate swirled, uh, transforming Jedwabne into a symbol of Polish antisemitism, the Jedwabnians began to react defensively. And in 2000, uh, the town was essentially lacking in any permanent repositories of memory or monuments that would uh, confirm meaning on the past. But after, this year, they decided to undertake various activities aimed at the construction of an alternative narrative of their common past, uh, concentrated on their own sufferings, uh, transforming Jedwabne into a Polish domain of, of martyrdom uh, in the religious uh, language expressed. And for example, uh, you can see this, uh, they planted a huge cross, a monument commemorating those uh, who had been deported uh, and murdered in the east. Uh, in the, uh, it is in the park overlooking at the Mines Market Square. And another important space of memory is a municipal uh, cemetery 
in front of a cemetery, a memorial to victims on the uh, NKVD, Nazis, and uh, Stalinist Office of Security. Uh, murdered be, uh, between 1939 and 1956 has been erected. And in the cemetery itself, there are uh, the graves of uh, home army soldiers at the tomb of an unknown soldier. See it, uh, which is uh, which a red and white flag waves on on a high mast for uh, for her long year old. In uh, 2016, uh, practically all our interviewees had something positive to say about this old memorial uh, commemorating murdered Jews uh, constructed in 1961. Uh, this, uh, this smaller one. And it turns out uh, from their comments that many Edwabians made a point of visiting the memorial, even uh, uh, when official memory tours changed following the change of political system in 1989. Uh, official delegation from the local high school continued to visit the Jewish memorial, and pupils were responsible for tending to the site. And uh, Marta Kurkowska Buzan, a historian who grew up in Jedwabne, writes that everyone knew about what happened uh, in 1941 in Jedwabne. And this intergener intergenerational transfer explains why young people tended to the memorial and prayed for the dead uh, by it. And before 2001, memory of the Jews in Jedwabne had a vernacular character. Community life in such areas is guided by Christian tradition, uh, which is why candles were left by the memorial and the Jews themselves, rather than being commemorated on the day they died, were remembered on the 1st of November, on the day of uh, all signs. Uh, like, everyone, um, yes, like everyone else who died in Poland. In, in fact, it's a, a, a very uh, important Polish tradition. And information about the 1st of November tradition appeared in all the interviews. And this shows that the Jewish memorial was treated like a symbolic cemetery, uh, at which the dead rather than the event itself were remembered. And uh, the last uh, example is a Markova and uh, the Ulma fam family uh, museum. Uh, it's a family that during the German occupation in 1942 uh, provided shelter in their home for eight Jews. Uh, and in uh, 1944, German military policemen, uh, accompanied also by blue police officer, appeared in the front of their house and uh, shot firstly hiding Jews, and then Josef uh, and Victoria, the parents, and Victoria was seven months pregnant. Uh, and they were murdered in front of their children. And when the commander took the decision to kill six children between, between uh, age uh, from eight years to eight months. And in January 1945, uh, after the front had moved westward, um, the Ulmas corpses were dug up uh, and moved to a Catholic cemetery uh, in uh, in, uh, close to the Markova. And immediately after the war, the Ulmas death was commemorated in a typical fashion rather than being afforded a special status. Uh, because uh, it was rather an, an exemplification of, um, of a family tragedy and not a German crime. But uh, in 1995, uh, the Yad Vashem Institute posthumously awarded Josef and Victoria Ulma with the Medal of Writers Among the Nation. Uh, but their story still was not uh, uh, recognized at the time because they, were, uh, they weren't uh, the first who were uh, from Markova who were awarded by this. But everything uh, changed in 2003 uh, where uh, the process of beatification started. Uh, it was a creation of this, uh, of this picture, uh, which is now in the, uh, close to the altar in the parish, parish church. And only after the beatification process started, the Ulma became uh, known uh, and respected in, in the community. And first, 
the secular monument was, was built, but with the visible religious elements. Uh, and uh, uh, we have the, uh, also urns uh, that symbolize uh, Joseph, Victoria, and all their children, also with the unborn one. But uh, when the idea of, of building uh, the Museum of Poles Rescuing Jews during the World War II came, and it was uh, open in uh, 2016, and this, uh, uh, this arche architectural design also was, uh, was uh, um, by Nizio Design uh, Studio. And uh, um, in, uh, next year, the memorial that local community built uh, was moved to that square, where a large group of people are able to join in, uh, in paying uh, homage to the Ulmas in front of the memorial. And while no objections were raised to the idea of moving the memorial a few hundred meters from its original site, the architectural studio idea to preserve only the stub itself but integrate it into a completely new architectural form met with resolute opposition from Markova's residents. It turned out from our conversation with the villagers that it was important to them that there were no changes uh, no changes in this memorial, uh, but uh, widely recognized. And to, to sum up, we have uh, uh, three ways of religious ways of dealing, uh, dealing with the past in these uh, three cases. Uh, so religion commemoration as a social duty, uh, religion as a uh, way of defense, and changing social position of, uh, of the perpetrators. And uh, like um, uh, uh, building a community of uh, descendants of the signs. And uh, in, uh, we came across in many uh, Polish uh, research that the religious commemoration in Poland um, is the effect on the influence of Polish national martyrdom. But uh, in our opinion, however, such reduc reductionist limits and narrows the meaning and understanding of religious commemorations. The fact that rural residents have chosen the cross as a form of commemoration does not result from the desire to sign in Polish martyrology. In their case, it, it is a natural action resulting from an individual ethnic aesthetical and epistemological belief in the justness of this a precise form, a form of commemoration. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mogotata. Uh, and now we continue to our next, next speaker, uh, Dr. Brandon Humphreys. Uh, he is a senior researcher and a lecturer at the Alexandria Institute. This is the um, University of Helsinki. Um, his um, chief interests are Central and Eastern Europe, the Cold War, uh, the usable past, nationalism, and the sociology of conflict. And now he's writing a book for uh, the Grutaire series, Rethinking the, Cold Wars, uh, Rethinking the Cold War. So the floor is yours, Brandon. Uh, thank you very much. And maybe we'll hide a little bit. And thank you to, for the organizers, particularly Susanna. It's really good to be here. The lecture topic. Um, well, we're starting with the kind of the ground zero statement of sacred and secular, Emile Durkheim's famous dichotomy, the, his assertion that there is no other example of two categories so profoundly differentiated or radically opposed to one another as the, the sacred and the profane. That's a very, very broad, um, very stringent statement he made. And if we look at that dichotomy, well, I'm going to ask, can it be challenged? Um, is it a binary? Is it perhaps better looked at as a specter rather than a tight binary opposite? Um, we could look at uh, Eliade's formulation of religious and form, secular and content. And the examples I'll choose are from Stalinist um, personality cults. Stalinism, of course, should be modernizing, secular, revolutionary, and so forth. But if we look at it, we'll start to challenge it. This uh, first image is from is from North Korea, and the, it's almost church-like. It's actually a metro station, and of course nobody in North Korea can afford to take the metro. 
Um, but you see the shining light of the dictator with the light coming from behind. And this is, I mean, classic sort of, if you like, religious imagery. And I think what we'll try to do is look at some of the epistemological, epistemological confusions that arise when one looks at Durkheim's dichotomy and use it, try and reflect it through, through a spectrum of different examples. One thing I wanted to talk about, speaking of belief systems, of secular belief systems, was the conversion experience. I mean, in a famous book with the interesting title, In the Context of the God That Failed, uh, Arthur Kessler wrote about his conversion, his very sudden conversion to Stalinism. He, he spoke of it in these terms, a new light seems to pour from all directions across the skull. The whole universe falls into a pattern as the stray pieces of a jigsaw puzzle assembled by magic all at once. Now this is a very, very strange sort of romantic emotive language to describe a conversion to a, a harsh political creed of modernity, communism. And communism, of course, offered a scientific interpretation of the world. Um, communism offer was, as, as Ost said, of Leninism, it was a civilization. Trotkin said the same thing about Stalinism. It was an entire belief system that politics worked this way, economy worked this way, metaphysics were dispensed with. We will give you the truth of how the world and how human history works. An extraordinarily high claim. One or two interesting perspectives on the secular profane um, dichotomy. I'll, I'll present one or two. One was from Marshall McLuhan, the famous uh, guru, if you like, interesting term under the circumstances, of new media, um, of media itself, in fact. He was the first person to use the, the, the term we use constantly, a global village. McLuhan came back into circulation with the invention of the internet because he found himself a re-guru for that um, <clears throat> the whole field of new media. His take on Russian culture is very interesting. He said, the sacred universe in this sense is one dominated by the spoken word and the auditory media. The profane universe, on the other hand, is one dominated by the visual sense. He's always taking this to a communicative aesthetic level of separating them. That sound is somehow sacred, visual is profane. This is a very interesting perspective. Um, the clock and the alphabet, by hacking the universe into visual segments, ended the music of interrelation. The visual desacralizes the universe and produces non-religious man of modern societies. This is a very, very interesting take on it. Another is um, by my friend and colleague in, in Helsinki, Marko Kivinen, sociologist of Russia. His unique take on this is that in the Bolshevik project, what the Bolsheviks actually did was reverse, invert the dichotomy. So if we see in the Soviet scheme of things, the holy is the modern, it is science, it's progress, development of the forces of production, urban, the proletariat, and of course the party. Whereas what is then taken back to the traditional is a secular, that is religion, backwardness, poverty, the countryside, the bourgeois, the czar, everything that the revolution is trying to dispense with. This again is a very, very interesting interpretation of the dichotomy and how it became inverted. If we look at more specifically religious thinkers, um, I'm thinking of Charles Taylor in this, when he speaks about the secular society, that the presumption of unbelief has become the dominant one in more of these milieu and has achieved hegemony in certain crucial ones. Of course, Taylor is, in a sense, bound to have these views. He's a practicing Catholic. And he is still, in a sense, Durkheim's dichotomy is, is, is still very much in there. It's still implicit in his text and his vision. If we look at Deliade, it's rather different. He, even if it's from the book, The Sacred and the Profane, he said, the man who has made his choice in favor of a profane life never succeeds in completely doing away with religious behavior. Even the most desacralized existence still preserves traces of a religious valorization of the world. This seems to me a kind of a loosening of the dichotomy. Even as I said explicitly, it's in the title of his book. This does allow that there would be some sort of traffic backwards and forth between these two binary opposites. Now, one analogy which we can put forward on that is the traditional views on gender, which are now been challenged hugely, I mean, paradigmatically throughout the world, an enormous culture camp of, 
of gay rights and so forth. I'm probably even out of date in just saying gay rights, but nonetheless. Um, traditionally, of course, in the Christian Judeo tradition, we have men and women, and any deviation on relationship was considered to be, well, exactly that, a deviation. Um, whereas now gender is seen much more as a spectrum. But it's not really just men or women that there's bisexuality, transsexuality, homosexuality, and so forth, and even subdivisions of that. So it's now looking like that paradigm has changed, that we no longer see gender as, as a binary, but rather as a spectrum of different possible identities. Now, this analogy does not necessarily translate back into what we're doing, but we can witness that we are seeing a paradigmatic shift in how we have viewed one profound aspect of, of human culture, human existence. And even, I'm, I, even, of course, I'm using the term gender here. Gender and sex are not the same thing, but because of modern medicine, it is actually possible to physically change your sex as well as your gender and how you identify sexually. Again, this is an analogy, and analogies don't necessarily work, but it's one way of looking at a change of paradigm. The usable past is something that historians are aware of, and everybody has been quoting many examples throughout this, uh, this conference. Um, to just quote Edward Said's, again, rather imprecise language that every society and official tradition defends itself against interferences of its sanctioned narratives over time, these acquire an almost theological status. That's again rather vague, but we can see where he's going with the logic. With founding heroes, cherished ideas, national allegories having an estimable effect on culture and political life. This is from cultural imperialism. And just one example of, if you like, the kind of sacralization or civic religion of nationalism, we see one example here, and it's not from, of course, it's from an open and liberal and democratic country, it's from the United States. Um, why a democracy needs such monumentalism is an interesting question. I mean, if democracy is about we the people, why on earth are we actually hewing up huge figures of semi-divine men? Of course, it's, it's commissioned by Theodore Roosevelt, who puts himself up there too. Um, but nonetheless, this is an example of the almost theological status of modern, uh, allegedly secular na national narratives. Hero worship and human agency to quote Hannah Arendt, who's been quoted already today. Um, in the modern age, history emerged as something that had never been before. It became a man-made process. It was no longer divine dispensation that had been in the medieval vision of the world, but rather an all-comprehensive process which owed its ex existence exclusively to the human race. Now, this is, of course, very much the aspect of modernity. I mean, we see these movements throughout the 19th century of, if you like, horizontal movements, a new belief in human agency, a belief in individuality. If we look at Rousseau's memoirs, he says, I am a unique person. I have never met anybody in the world like myself. This is a very modern claim of individuality. And as we see the inclusion of mass politics following the French Revolution, more and more people become involved. There's a, it's an, an age of optimism of human agency. Pe enormous things can be done. Um, both Marx, both Tolstoy, from very different ideological positions, are very, very good observers of this process. Marx famously said, men make their own history. Um, throughout war and peace, we see Tolstoy me me meditating on the possibilities of human existence. The one figure, of course, who emerges as this is Napoleon Bonaparte, the man who seemingly could do anything. The Nietzschean superhero before the Superman is ever even invented. He is, of course, both revered in Tolstoy's novel and considered the Antichrist in Tolstoy's novel. Um, but he, in, in a sense, he he's also corresponds with the Romantic movement of Beethoven and, and numerous other things, and he seems to embody the possibilities of human agency. While at the same time, I spoke about the horizontal movement of political inclusion, at the same time we have the opposite movement of hero worship of the single figure. And as touched on, this works both in open and closed political systems, democratic if you like, communist if you like, of uh, the sanctification of national narratives and so forth, monumentalism. If we just take two visual examples of this, one is, of course, from Washington, D.C. It's Lincoln Memorial. Um, the other is from uh, Bucharest. It's the Avenue of the Triumph of Socialism. I believe that parliament building is actually the largest building on the continent of Europe. 
which was built in the 1980s by Ceausescu. And just something about, I mean, architecturally, visually, they're very, very artificial both. They're very contrived, very much about communicating a message of greatness, of the cult in one case of Abraham Lincoln, in the other, of course, of the, this is what called the, the avenue of the triumph of the victory of socialism or something rather <laughs> easy on the tongue like that. But the visual, uh, the visual um, resemblance between the two is, to me, at least striking. Um, if we go to seeking great man status and seeking political legitimacy, um, one of the interesting personality cults of the, of the 20th century is the cult of Ataturk in, in Turkey. Turkey is a secular republic created by Ataturk, but nonetheless he is a revered figure. And Turkey, of course, I mean, the Armenian genocide was mentioned. This is still a very, very bitter, bitter contested and open issue. But Erdogan, for instance, is obviously measuring himself, himself up as a great man in the, in the tradition of Ataturk and trying to create a sort of a personality cult around himself. Personality cults are, are slightly different if they're ongoing and dynamic, if the person is still alive, or if they're retrospective and the, the biography of the person is closed, and in that sense it's easier to construct. Now, if I want to look, I mean, taking that the McLuhan's assertion that the visual is, is more profane, I think we can look at the, actually the reverse process. Just a few kind of classic images of the Stalinist personality cults. If we look at the man himself, first of all, we note in all of these personality cults is the kitschy nature of the aesthetic. It tends to be dripping in sentimentalism, the type of thing you'd put on a wall in a kebab restaurant, for instance. Um, here we have Stalin, of course, been greeted by many happy citizens of his country. He's standing in some sort of a lecture, a podium, which gives him the impression of great height. We know Stalin wasn't tall. But uh, nonetheless, he, 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 he gets a bit of a leg up here, so he could almost be playing for the Chicago Bulls. Um, he's dressed in white, although it's, it, it actually there is some military... Um, significance to what he's wearing. Stalin, of course, had no military training whatsoever, even if he became a marshal after the war. We'll get back to the white suit in a moment. Move on to our next, the leader of um, one of the strangest of the Stalinist cults. In fact, he was even more puritanistic than Stalin and became a Maoist and, and so forth, Hoxha in Albania. Um, Hoxha was normal height, more or less. But if he were to stand up, he'd be about like half a meter taller than everybody else. Again, this, this kind of insecure, masculine, standard masculine insecurity seems to be part of, of being a great man. I don't know why that is. But um, I, li I like particularly the way, he's also in a white suit, but the way he's sort of gathered around as a kind of dispenser of wisdom. He's almost priest or saint-like. The hand up explaining how science and modernity and whatever are going to work and tra transform the life of the of the peasants who seem really, really grateful. He just looks like a sort of grandfather, uncle figure, very patriarchal and so forth. Again, very, very, very sentimental. Um, Ceausescu himself. Okay, thanks. Um, aesthetically, this is probably the worst. Um, very sentimental indeed. Again, we're in a white suit. Um, I noticed a couple of Balkanists in the room, and I would have included Tito in this if I'd known, because Tito was a great wearer of white suits also, and a short guy. Um, but here we have, um, this is actually depicting the house where he grew up, which, was, which became a museum, almost a site of, if you like, pilgrimage during his, his, his reign and his personality cult, um, you know, to show his peasant background, that he was one of the people and so forth. And uh, again, he's elevated to great height. Ceausescu was short and really, really insecure about his height. He did everything he could to sort of look slightly taller when he was in... in, in um, and um, whenever he was depicted. Um, again, that the common, that this combination of sort of great manness, um, masculine sort of insecurity, uh, various roles projected through these things. Nonetheless, he, does, he looks like a, a school teacher, father figure, something like that, and he's got that rather wooden wave going on there. Um, and if we go finally, this is just the strangest one. I mean, this is an ongoing personality cult. Okay, we have grandfather and father, and now we have grandson running North Korea. This was just the strangest one, because it depicts two dictators, not one. So we have two great men, not one. Luckily enough, 
the height problem isn't an issue here. They're both of equal height, and there's children there to make them both look taller. So neither guy sort of emasculates the other one by being a bit taller than him. Um, again, aesthetically, it couldn't be kitschier. I mean, it's, it's real kebab restaurant stuff. Um, the children looking up grateful, again, that slightly wooden wave. Who waves like that? I always like Gore Vidal's description of how he and John Kennedy used to pretend to wave to crowds in the, the manner of the British royal family, that they would be unscrewing jars of mayonnaise that were held upside down in, in that way. Um, they, they really haven't learned how to wave. Obviously, the junior is pointing towards a wonderful future. The children are looking up grateful. Please observe what they're standing on. That is not a field of flowers. That is not a meadow of daisies. Those are actually people. Yes, if you can zoom in on that, those are the people. They are the grateful nation of North Korea. Um, those tiny little people. This is like from Gulliver's Travels or something. This super sentimentalized image that not only are they great men, they're in fact giants. And the grateful people are looking up at them with the children as kind of intermediate level, just to make the guys look tall. Um, it's one of the most bizarre images I've ever seen projecting a personality cult. Unfortunately, the tragedy is, of course, that grandson is still there and the people of North Korea are still living in a, the, just about the worst prison that there is on, on, on the globe. So, to conclusions. In Leninism, the party, of course, was the vanguard of the people, scientifically interpreting the world for them through Marxism and building socialism according to the actual dialectics of history. With Stalinism, what we now have is not only a dedicated and disciplined party only, we have a charismatic leader at the top, charismatic, of course, in the Iberian sense. The image of the leader as a great man was rather based on 19th century romanticism. It was on royalist politics, and the royalist politics system that Lenin so proudly brought crashing down in 1917. Yet the images and the true claims become, in a sense, less scientific. I mean, you see this combination of whatever it is that relies on, on sentiment, on masculine fantasy, of patriarchalism, of largeness, and so forth. So in a sense, the profane is robbed of its realism, and it leaks into the sacred, if I may say that. Though without the metaphysics, of course, it's still supposedly a scientific worldview. There is no god in the picture. There is only the great man who is leading the party and the nation. And the one aspect, I should have worked this in earlier, the one aspect of the, the, the sacred is its unchallengeable status. And this has become secularized in the modern vision of the Stalinist personality cult. And I'll leave it at there. I think we have a couple of minutes to go. So, Jinkuya, uh, Spasiba, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. And uh, we proceed to Ekaterina Klimenko, uh, who works at the Graduate School of Social Research Institute of Philosophy and Sociology at Polish Academy of Sciences. Ekaterina uh, received her Candidate of Science degree in Cultural Studies at the St. Petersburg State University of Culture and Arts in 2010. Um, her research interests are ethnicity and nationalism, nation building and national identity, political use of history and and diversity management. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this beautiful event. And it is a true honor for me to be here today and present the results of my humble work. Uh, the, the topic I'm going to talk about today is a part of a bigger project that is funded by the Polish National Science Center. And the leading researcher is Zuzana Bogumil, who is supposed to be here, but she <laughs> unfortunately is not at the moment. Uh, and we focus in this project on the way the Russian Orthodox Church influences the memory, memory politics in contemporary Russia. So working on this broader issue, I came across, in a way, uh, of, the, of the issue I'm going to talk about today. And the topic that I find uh, personally very, very uh, fascinating. I will not uh, dwell on theoretical background of my research. It's a set of uh, well-known and widely shared ideas. The basic premise here is that uh, to legitimize a modern state, it is necessary to build a nation. And to build a nation, it is necessary to invent uh, the, the historical uh, national narrative uh, to narrate the history of this nation. And while doing 
doing so uh, implies remembering as well as forgetting. It is quite obvious that there are certain events that we cannot ignore. They have to be remembered in one way or another. And uh, Russian revolutions of 1917 are beyond any doubt one of uh, such events. So as uh, 2017 was going by, uh, observers both inside and outside of Russia were asking the same question. Why is it that Russia's incumbent elite are not celebrating the revolution? Why is the revolution being forgotten in Russia and the memory of it is being suppressed? And although different answers were given to this question, the consensus was that since the political elite have no idea what to do with the revolution or how to commemorate it, uh, they resorted to this um, type of oblivion of totally forgetting uh, the event or trying to forget it. Uh, so in my uh, paper today, I want to challenge this consensus. The point I'm trying to make is uh, very simple, in fact, maybe called primitive in a way. My argument is that there is, in fact, a specific interpretation of the Russian revolutions which is nested within a broader historical narrative, and it is being forged in contemporary Russia that it was developed and it is now being disseminated in cooperation between the Russian Orthodox Church and the state, that this interpretation of the revolution allows for turning politically problematic past into a politically usable one. That a lot indicates that this interpretation of the revolution is becoming official in today Russia. And crucial for reproduction of this specific interpretation of the revolution and the broader narrative that this interpretation is nested within uh, is the so-called uh, multimedia historical parks, Russia, my history. So first of all, I want to say a few words of what is this project, Russia, my history. The beginning of it dates back to the 1990s, in fact, 1995, when a small exhibition fair, Orthodox Rus, Pravoslavna Rus, was held in Mikhailovsky Manej in St. Petersburg. It was a success, and the decision was taken to further develop the project. It later grew into a grand annual forum entitled Ecclesiastical Public Exhibition Forum Orthodox Rus. Believes me, it sounds in, in Russian as horrible as it does in English. Although it was popular enough with Orthodox believers, organizers of the project decided to reach out for a wider audience. They did so in 2011, holding the exhibition Russian Orthodox Church, a summary of 20 years, 1991-2011. The exhibition was organized by the Patriarch's Council uh, for Culture, which had been created one and a half years earlier. And uh, Russian Orthodox Church a summary told the story of restoration of church life in the canonical territory of the Moscow Patriarchate in the post-Soviet period. Organizers of the exhibition employed new technologic and design solutions, multimedia devices, interactive devices, and so on and so forth, that turned the, the, the exhibition into a great success. So the success encouraged them to again further develop their project. They came up with a very interesting and inspiring idea of uniting the history of Russia and these technological and design solutions that they employed in the 2011 uh, exhibition. Thus, the project Orthodox Rus, My History, was born. Pravoslavna Rus, Maya Historia in Russian is, is the title. So two years later, uh, on 4 November 2013, the Romanovs, the first multimedia exhibition of the cycle Orthodox Rus, My History, was opened in Moscow, Manesh. It was dedicated to the 400th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty and narrated the history of Russia from 1613, from the accession uh, to the throne of Mikhail Romanov, uh, until the revolution of 1917 and the execution of the last uh, Russian emperor of the Romanov dynasty, Nicholas II, and his family. Uh, the response of the audience was overwhelming indeed. People literally queued for up to seven, eight hours to, to see the exhibition. Uh, and it came as a surprise even for creators of the project. So again, they made a decision to go further. Uh, on uh, November 4, 2014, the exhibition entitled The Rurikids, dedicated to the 700th anniversary of Sergius of Radenish, one of the most venerated Russian saints, was opened in Moscow, Manej. And in the following years, uh, 2000. Um, 
15 and 16, the project was uh, completed with two exhibitions, From Great Upheavals to Great Victory, which narrated the history of Russia of the first half uh, of the 20th century, and 1945-2016. Shortly after the Ruri kits had been demonstrated in Moscow, creators came up with a different and rather ambitious strategy of developing their project. They decided to unite all the four exhibitions of the cycle under one roof and call what would happen as a result historical parks Russia, my history, have them operating permanently all over Russia. The first of such historical parks was opened in 2015, in, in the end of December of uh, 2015 in Moscow, and later on uh, the parks mushroomed all over Russia. There are now 17 of them and there are more to follow. The organizers of the project have absolutely no intention to stop here. Uh, what is uh, of crucial importance? is that some of Russia's most respected scholarly and educational institutions, including the Institute of History of the Russian Academy of Sciences, the Russian State University for Humanities, the State Archive of the Russian Federation, are mentioned as having contributed to creating the content of the park's exhibitions. We don't exactly know the, the role that they played in creating this content, but uh, the, the role of one person in creation of the whole project is always stressed. That is uh, Tikhon Shevkunov, today Metropolitan Tikhon Shevkunov, who is repeatedly referred to in media, in both Russian and foreign media, as Vladimir Putin's personal confessor. Although he denies it, but we, we have no idea, <laughs> at least I have no idea, whether it is, uh, it is true uh, or not. So what do historical parks, Russia, my history, look like? This is more or less <laughs> the way they look like. So, like I said, they include four exhibitions, the Rurikids, the Romanovs, the, uh, From a Great Upheaval to Great Victory, and 1945-2016. Each of the four exhibitions is in turn composed of halls. These halls flow from one into another, thus creating the space-time of Russian history, Advancing along the corridor-shaped space of the park's exhibitions, a visitor travels through time from ancient Rus to contemporary Russia. Interestingly, a visitor has little freedom in choosing which of the exhibition's halls to view and which to skip. She hence follows the path set out by historical park's creators, and as she does so, the history of the Russian state, and what is uh, very important, uh, the history of the Russian Orthodox Church, unfold before her eyes. In the historical parks Russia My History, four exhibitions are on display, but no exhibits. All that is demonstrated in the parks are multimedia devices, interactive devices, screens, panels, light boxes, and so on and so forth, on which thousands of pages of texts are uh, projected. These exhibitions are very much like a history textbooks, which the visitors are supposed to read. It is probably important to stress that visitors almost never do so. So what affects them is uh, basically the design of the space, the light, the color, but not the exact texts uh, that are lengthy and, well, uh, probably quite boring <laughs> to, to spend hours reading. Uh, so what is the vision of the revolution that is represented and reproduced in this chain of historical parks? First of all, 1914 is represented here as the point of fracture. It was then that Russia peaked in its development under the reign of one of its greatest leaders, Nicholas II, and it was then that it was enmeshed in war by treacherous Europe. The February of uh, 1917 is depicted here as the opening act of the drama of Russia's 20th uh, century. The real, the real quote-unquote reasons behind the revolution, according to creators of the parks, are petty intrigues of enemies inside and outside of Russia. Russia's internal enemies were intelligentsia and aristocracy, pursuing the former their wrong political ideas and the latter their private interests. Russia's external, actually eternal and external at the same time, enemies were, of course, foreign rivals worried by Russia's rapid economic development, shortly the West. 
the October Revolution is seen as the nearly inevitable consequence of the February one. Bolsheviks, paradoxically enough, are portrayed as Russia's saviors. They manage to salvage Russia by restoring, although in different shape and form, the Russian state precisely at the moment when its utter collapse uh, seemed inevitable. The figure of Joseph Stalin is crucial here. He is pictured as controversial yet outstanding political leader who played the key role in restoring Russia's grandeur and, surprisingly enough, Russian Orthodox Church. As opposed to Stalin, Lenin and Trotsky are represented in the parks as destructors of both the state and the church. Among the victims of the Russian revolutions, Nicholas II and his family on the one hand and Orthodox believers on the other are emphasized. If the former fell prey to senseless cruelty of revolutionaries striving for power, the latter suffered for their faith. Overall, the interpretation of the Russian revolutions created in the historical parks is that of tragic mistake committed by the Russian people lured by populist simplistic slogans. Lured by populist simplistic so slogans is direct quotation from one of the movies demonstrated in, in, in the parks. Everything that followed the revolutions, including the civil war, the Stalinist repressions, the great patriotic war, is represented here as the cost of this mistake and at the same time as the price that needed to be paid for Russia's future resurrection. The resurrection, of course, was embodied in the victory in the great patriotic war and also the post-war triumph of the Soviet Union. Importantly, the story of the Russian revolutions can be and often is narrated in uh, or told in the language of Orthodox faith. And Tatiana Voronina yesterday spoke about it uh, in, in greater detail. The concepts of sin, retribution, and atonement substitute here for those of mistake, cost, and price. From the tale about the Tsar who abdicated his throne, it turns into that about the people which abdicated its Tsar and its God. The ordeals that followed the revolutions were nothing less than retribution and atonement for the committed sin of the revolution. Nicholas II and his family were martyrs who gave their lives for Russia and its people. Martyrs were Orthodox believers who, being persecuted by the Soviet state, suffered for their faith. It was those martyrs who, through their sacrifice, earned Russia's future salvation. The phenomenon of new martyrdom is, of course, crucial here, uh, crucial for the religious reading of the Russian Revolution. Tikhon Shekhunov, the demiurge of the project Russian My History, is probably one of the most prominent of the hierarchs of the Russian Orthodox Church today, that is, that invests greatly in perpetuating the memory of the new martyrs in, in Russia. Nonetheless, in the parks, the history of the Russian revolutions is narrated in secular, but not in religious terms. Indeed, the history of the persecution of the Russian Orthodox Church is represented here in great detail. Moreover, the very concept new martyrs and confessors of Russia is used here extensively. However, creators of the historical parks do not go further in representing the religious narrative of the history of the Russian revolutions. The project Russia, my history, may be considered uh, a meeting point, so to speak, where the two visions of the revolutions, the secular and the religious ones, intertwine. Nonetheless, it is the elements of the secular vision of the revolution that are more pronounced in the interpretation of the uh, Russian revolutions that is reproduced in the historical parks, Russia, my history. That this interpretation, thus, is not so much orthodoxizing the history of the Russian Revolution as it is secularizing the orthodox reading of it. This demonstrates in a rather peculiar way the process which Yuri Tepper points at in one of his latest articles. As rapprochement between Russian Orthodox Church and Russian state continues, it is not only that the state is becoming more religious, it is also the church that is becoming more secular or mundane institution, if you like. Anyhow, in the historical parks, the history of the Russian revolutions is narrated as the tale of national disaster. The trope central for this tale is that of national unity and disunity. As the nation becomes divided into reds and whites, the state perishes in their internal strife. As the nation unites around a strong leader, of course, consolidation of the state follows. 
the tale of the Russian revolu revolutions that is represented in the historical parks is nested within the narrative that covers Russian history from Prekievan Rus up to annexation of Crimea. This history unfolds like a pendulum swings from the periods of stability accompanied with order and prosperity towards the times of smuta, revolutionary changes, followed with chaos and decay. The emphasis here is again on national unity. National disunity inevitably results in collapse of the state, consolidation of the nation is followed with the state's resurrection. This very pattern is used here to tell the stories of fragmentation and the yoke followed by the rise of Moscow, of the time of troubles followed by the accession of the Romanov dynasty to the throne, of the revolution of 1917 followed by the victory in the Great Patriotic War, and finally of the disintegration of the USSR followed by today Russia rising up from its knees. Importantly, the Russian Orthodox Church is represented here as contributing, in fact, a great deal contributing to the nation, uh, to uniting the nation, thus reintegrating and st strengthening the state. Striking, strikingly enough, in the historical parks, the Russian revolutions are placed in a narrative that turns them into the story of unity and continuity, not the story of divide and rupture. Russian history, as it is narrated in these parks, legitimizes the Russian state as, and the political regime that is being forged or has already been forged in, in, in today Russia. It represents the today Russia, first of all, as inheriting a thousand-year-old tradition of statehood. Further on, it puts emphasis on centralized executive power and represents it as natural, or the only natural for the country. It focuses on stability and frames it as something to be cherished and preserved. Stability is one of the crucial co concepts for symbolic politics uh, of uh, Vladimir Putin. It portrays the state as value in itself, regardless of its stability or inability to secure the well-being of its citizens. At the same time, this narrative justifies the privileged position of Orthodox Christianity as Russia's quasi-official religion. Moreover, it provides answers to difficult, so to speak, difficult questions of Russian history, including the history of the Russian Orthodox Church, of which the most pressing probably is the question of collaboration of the Church with the communist regime. The orthodoxized reading of Russian history and the very narrow vision of national community that are represented in the historical parks, Russia, my history, are rather problematic for multi-ethnic and what is even more important today, multi-religious Russia. This is, I think, evident. Uh, it is hardly surprising, Hans, that as the project Russia, my history develops, Orthodox Christianity and the Russian Orthodox Church are becoming less visible elements of it. First, the very term Orthodox disappeared from the title of the project, which was changed from Orthodox Rus, my history, into Russia, my history. Further, the content uh, of the exhibitions of the historical parks was completed with segments dedicated to Russia's traditional religions, Islam, Buddhism, and Judaism. Moreover, the design, and to a lesser degree, the content of the historical parks exhibitions was modified to de-emphasize the role of Orthodox Christianity and the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia's history and culture. As Russia My History is growing, one can witness the project initially developed within the Russian Orthodox Church gradually secularize. Along with this secularization, the way Russian history is narrated and the community of Russians is envisioned in the historical parks, parks is becoming less religious, which is again points us to the question how civic Russian civil religion is and how religious is today Russia's Orthodox Church. This is, of course, a preliminary conclusion because the project is developing and I hope that my research will develop also. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for this uh, very engaging uh, continuation of uh, the uh, speech which was given by Professor Zubrzycki about this need to approach this dichotomy between profane and uh, sec um, sacred. And now we will listen to the com uh, commentator and then we will proceed to uh, general discussion. Uh, yeah.
The, <clears throat> the presented paper uh, differ from each another. However, one can find some uh, common motive in the, I decided it will be the issue of uh, commemorative practice <coughs> saturated with uh, religious form. Uh, what role do play uh, do they play in a commem uh, commemorative culture? Uh, can they be a, a surrogate of religion? Can be they consider it as a non theistic religion? There are a very important question in the context of changing taking place in a contemporary culture, especially in the context of tension between modern, postmodern, and to some degree pre-modern uh, culture. Therefore, I want to formulate three uh, questions we carry and uh, add, to, add my comments to them, short comments. The question one, is the uh, penetration of religion into commemorative, uh, commemorative uh, practice proper to our time only, or uh, has, uh, has it always been done? And my comment, <coughs> religion and uh, social memory are similar uh, to each other in some respect. Both try to overcome uh, finiteness of human existence. Then, both uh, use the same time. It is a, mythic, a mystical time, uh, the sense of which is the uh, assumption that uh, what happened once upon the time is uh, still a leaf, is still, uh, is still a current. And my conclusion to this remark is that both religion and uh, commemorative practice uh, and commemoration have uh, always had something in common. Therefore, the borrowing of uh, some form, uh, some, some form uh, from religious but commemorative practice, especially if they concern human beings, were uh, always down. What is uh, the new is uh, the intensity of this phenomenon. And now is question two. Uh, this, is a, this is the question uh, about the factor that stimulates that uh, uh, they mentioned it uh, ago, moment ago, uh, intensification uh, of the commemorative, uh, 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 of the penetration religious into uh, commemorative practice. Uh, um, uh, Raza Bots, Bolotskaita, yes, I put this way, <laughs> uh, pointed to one of these uh, stimulants. It was uh, the lack of secular language uh, that uh, could adequately express uh, the commemoration. I want to add to, uh, to, to I, I want to add uh, two more uh, two, two more uh, to, um, to them. Its first first uh, stimulator of, of this process is um, the following: uh, significant uh, significant area of contemporary culture are characterized by fluency, by ceaseless changeability of the social orders of values, pattern, behavior. The, those are the features of uh, postmodern culture. Uh, satur uh, saturation the remembrance practice with religious element is counterbalanced to this uh, postmodern trends. It establishes area of stability and uh, allow us to use the category of long durée. And uh, in this way, it makes the uh, values, behavior, be behavior, uh, behavioral patterns, norm, can be perceived in category uh, long durée. It means be important not only hic et nunc, but uh, in the long run. Then they change his uh, their status. Uh, Secular commemorative practice refer to history. That is, they aren't uh, universal nor eternal. Uh, not eternal by themselves. Borrowing a religious uh, form, secular history become less accidental and take on 
more universal and more eternal character. I agree with this point with uh, Brendan Humphrey. And second, uh, agent stimulating. Historical culture of the 20th, 20th century was an intellectual culture. It was close in message that had to be interpreted, that had to be uh, that had to be uh, subjected to critical reflection. <laughs> in the contemporary culture, nonverbal message, as happening per picture, are dominant. It is it's a visual culture. In such culture, the culture of performance, uh, not the intellect, but the senses play a leading role in experiencing the past. Visualization uh, of culture facilitates the uh, penetration of commemorative practice by religious, uh, by religious form. The, uh, because religion is saturated to large degree with visual, uh, visual language too. And point three, the last, a function of commemorative satur commemoration saturated with uh, religious elements. Theories such as Emil Durkheim, Rudolf Otto, Mirza Eliade attribute uh, various uh, social functions to religion. Which of them are important in commemorative uh, commemora commemoration saturated with religious uh, form? Among the many functions uh, that uh, commemorative uh, practices uh, using the religious language can fulfill. The most important is an integrative one. Commemorative practice saturated with religious form allow us to experience participation in the community, but it's particular participation. The experience is this experience which often taken mystical form. This phenomenon can be interpreted, I won't interpret it, as a counterbalance to postmodern culture also. Uh, what the, what, uh, what, uh, it, it, it is very interesting that this counterbalance in implementing using the pre-modern language and to some degree, it's paradox, the postmodern language. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now you have possibility to reply to these comments. Uh, who wants to start? Rasa, you can start as uh, we are speaking the first. Okay, uh, but uh, you won't uh, respond no, to this? No, I don't know. Ah, okay, uh, okay. Know so uh, le let's uh, collect the questions from the audience. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for absolutely fascinating panel. It was uh, very interesting uh, because everyone, every of you have a very clear topic and very clear examples and, and very nice pictures. <laughs> And uh, my question for um, uh, Rasa, for you, um, when we are talking about Lithuanian uh, historical memory, is it only about the traumatic um, experience, a traumatic uh, sujet in this memory? And if not, uh, how, what kind of language used for, to commemorate the other events? Is uh, it still religion, religion or is it something others. That's my question. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, Brandon, the question for you. As a person who is uh, also have a great interest to the Soviet culture and probably not in a Stalinist, but who is working with the social realism things, my question is, uh, what do you think? Uh, if they, the communists find uh, their own language for commemoration, or it's just take the all uh, from the Christianity of the uh, orthodox symbols. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a small question to Ekaterina. I mean, that have you ever found a certain uh, religiosity in the so-called immortal parade? 
Have, I mean, because they say the, the, the procession or the form in the immortal parade to celebrate the victory, in a sense, these uh, participants are wearing badges uh, with the faces of their fathers and grandfathers. It uh, reminds me of a sort of a, a religious procession that has been done. And the other one is rather general question about the terminologies. You know, civil religion, you talked of civil religion and the, the, I, I prefer a political religion or secular religion, but also, I mean, the Emilio Gentile, who is uh, uh, the scholar on the Italian fascism, he coined the term of secularization of politics. So in many cases, uh, the, if we begin to use the term of political religion, or secular religion, or civil religion, it looks like a little bit too much, how can I, certain well, fixed or too much consolidated. But if we uh, take the term of secularization of politics, it may comprehend some more, how can I say, some more flexible, flexible practices of um, making the politics uh, in with uh, certain religious uh, the clothes or religious creeds. Uh, thank you. Um, there were very interesting similarities between the material, uh, Professor. Um, sorry, Balak Balonkaite. <laughs> Rasa, just say my first okay. name. Um, presented and uh, the, those crosses we observed. Um, uh, uh, thanks to uh, Professor Zubrzycki's uh, lecture before. And I'm wondering about the uh, differences between those crosses. Uh, if I observed it well, there were some decorations on many of the crosses you, um, you showed us yes. uh, that were referring somehow to pre-Catholic religiosity of Lithuania. Uh -huh. uh, I'm just wondering if uh, like th this uh, religious language you presented as the one the um, people traumatized by the like mm -hmm. uh, period that they weren't able to talk about. Uh, maybe there are different religious languages they are uh, reaching to, 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 um, to speak to now. <laughs> and the other one for uh, Professor Kowatska Greiter, Greiper, sorry, excuse me. Um, I've, I'm wondering if there is a um, possibility of maybe com um, uh, some discussion between w your thesis and what uh, Professor Humphreys presented, maybe uh, to look of this, on these uh, differences between the local and official um, commemoration of certain events in Poland as more a spectrum than a di dichotomy, because you presented some uh, chart at the beginning with a very strong dichotomy, um, like labels, dichotomical labels, that's, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it can be more nuanced. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I have uh, two questions, uh, one for our guests from Lithuania, it's also about the language, and uh, I'm interested in your opinion about the change of the name of the Museum of Genocide, yes? Mm -hmm. Because a lot, it's a very important place for Lithuanian identity. The, the Museum of Genocide in Vilno. Mm -hmm. it, uh, yesterday was the lecture about the Lithuania and the visit of Pope, and I think for a lot of Lithuanian people, the visiting of Pope in this museum was more important than visit of Pope in the Ostra Brahma, Ashurovartu, yes? It, and this museum for many years uh, had the name genocide, etc. And few months ago, as I know, it must change. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it, it, now it's not the Museum of Genocide. Yeah. The name of genocide is banned for Lithuanian people. So I'm interested in your opinion about future of Lithuanian identity without the words of genocide, yes? Okay. And I have a question to the, our guest from Poland. Uh, don't you think it's some kind of mistake, methodological mistake, to compare three villages from Poland, because two of them was in the Second World War on the German occupation, but Jedwabne was on the Soviet occupation. So these three villages have totally different history. And I think for a lot of people from Jedwabne and from the Białystok, Grodno, etc., the, if you take first book of Tomasz Gross, 
which was published in the USA, it was unfortunately some kind of Soviet Jew occupation. Uh, of course, a lot of Poles collaborated with Soviet, yes, but unfortunately only Jew pay f for it. So it's totally different uh, history. So it's not a methodological mistake to compare them. Okay, Thank and uh, let's take uh, one last question and then we will uh, answer these questions. And if we have uh, time left, then uh, we will have a second round of questions. But if not, then uh, we can discuss during the lunch. I have, thank you. I have two questions to Rasa. Uh, I was wondering to what extent all those vernacular shrines and crosses and commemoration signs derived from uh, grassroots initiatives of local people living nearby, and to what extent all these commemorational signs and shrines are going from um, up initiative, state initiative, or higher rent Lithuanian clergy initiative, Roman Catholic Church in Lithuania, and so on. And what is the difference between them? Mm -hmm. And the second question is rather ethnographic. As an anthropologist, I can't, uh, I cannot uh, ask it, uh, can't but ask it. Uh, did you ever observe some practices near all these shrines? How do people behave themselves? And uh, do all these shrines are so meaningful for them? Or there are some narrations that are, again, imposed from the high level of state or Roman Catholic Church in Lithuania. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, start? please, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I should start from the first question. This, thank you for a very good question. So if it's uh, religious language is applied to traumatic experience only or to positive experience only. So first of all, I was thinking, what is the positive experience? Because Lithuanian identity is so much built against, like, you know, occupation, trauma, suffering, and it's dominant, clearly dominating. My point is that probably positive experience, like building of this state of achievements, anniversaries, victories, are less related with religion and more with the, you know, human achievements and celebration of, uh, I don't know, national unity, strength, and focus on humans, human, human power than on divine. But to some extent, your question also made me think about this, even contemporary identity politics. Like, for example, Vilnius now t today is positioned as a city of angels, and it's decorated with the small statues. Many buildings and many locations are decorated with the small angels. They're kind of modified, not like really in a Catholic tradition or Catholic paintings, but more like, like dolls, like, 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 you know, uh, like toys. But again, it's kind of religious language is still incorporated, even there is no trauma, but kind of little bit of religious symbolism and religious language. And yeah, my second question was about the pre-Catholic aspect and pre-Catholic decorations on the crosses, if I'm correct. So my point is that I would not call, okay, not clearly pre-Catholic because this cross making uh, became, became like a national art, national tradition and people simply incorporate it. So it's like a long lasting Lithuanian tradition of cross making that is based on uh, incorporation on, of different ethnic, I would say not pre-Catholic, but ethnic elements. So as it has been said earlier, this incorporating other traditions and other experience do not make them less sacred, but make them more sacred. And regarding the third question, genocide museum, um, yeah, I think that, I mean, it's, it was a scholarly decision, right? political decision, academic decision to change name of museum, so I'm, I don't know what, what I'm supposed to say. Um, I don't like, like translating my personal opinion and I don't like being a judge to the world or to the people. There was consensus, there were specialists, there were discussions, and so it was decided. And I'm more interested in how trauma works on an individual level and I think that Lithuanian identity still be, will be based pretty much on suffering and it's kind of uh, how to say it in English, um, sacralization of their own suffering, no matter how you call it, and no matter what the political decisions are being made. And the last question, as I understand, is like a, the question was if these initiatives are made a, like a, originate on the top and imposed on society or vice versa. Variety of these 
It's, it's a mixture of everything. I would say most of them are partisan initiatives, like uh, bottom from, uh, grassroots initiatives, or some initiatives. Some initiatives are in some monuments, like the park of the, for the partisans, are initiated by the church. So state involvement is like a so-so. So mostly there's a grassroots initiatives or initiatives by the church. And again, there is a, there's, I had, there was no, not enough time to discuss all the aspects. In this field, there, is a, there are larger debates, whether is the church is monopolizing the, the, the discourse or whether the state is transferring the responsibility uh, uh, to the church. But uh, again, dominant player is either the church or the people or communities. Whether I've seen some practices and how these, these places are meaningful, yes, I've seen some practices. And in some cases, uh, oh, sorry, I'm mixing it with another project about Mariana apparitions. Uh, no, in this, 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 these places are kind of, you know, very, they have very, very weird, very weird status. Some, and very, very, the status are very different. Like one park is like, uh, let's, the, the Hill of Crosses in a, in a former place where the Soviet tank was standing. It's abandoned. And to, some people randomly are put, play, coming there to pray, to put flowers, uh, to put candles, but just like random private, private individuals. In a, another case, it's, it's significant for the church, and there are like a national kind of national day of commemoration with the, with the presence of, of church officials, but the places are really, really very different. I don't want to generalize and come to one conclusion. But to your for the first question, the state is kind of not the major actor in, in organizing and shaping this discourse. Thank you very much for all the questions. And the first one, uh, dichotomy or spectrum. Uh, I think we can uh, talk about spectrum when we are dealing with uh, uh, state projects. But on the local level, uh, we uh, choose the par parish local uh, small communities. And in fact, uh, there is no discussion uh, in, between inhabitants of, of these communities uh, on the commemoration of the dead. It is obvious that the language is religious, but it is a religious commemoration. And there are no uh, more uh, secular or more sacred commemorations. All are in the, in the same epistemological field. But when we uh, came to um, state uh, projects, like museum, mausoleum, uh, I think we can speak uh, uh, about spectrum. Some of are um, more uh, secular and, or, and the others are more sacred projects. And it, it's also um, a matter of uh, negotiations between uh, different actors involved in the building of uh, this memory site and in negotiation uh, with the local community uh, who is uh, um, a host of, of this national uh, project. Uh, and also uh, this, um, um, this question which Professor Szpocinski raised, uh, the critical reflection on the past and on commemoration and the practices of, uh, and social practices toward the past uh, in uh, local circumstances are, are something different, uh, I think. And uh, in these local, local communities, we are rather uh, have to uh, deal with uh, practices um, on the uh, Mm, coming in terms uh, with, term in the, uh, with the past, then uh, uh, critical commemoration and developing uh, uh, commemoration projects. And uh, on the question on comparing, we are not comparing the history of, of these places. Uh, uh, we, are, uh, we were interested in the using of religious uh, language. And by using uh, this language uh, and, and way of thinking also in the specific situation. In the situation where the uh, small parish community uh, became a symbol of a national character. Of course, from different reasons. 
is, but, uh, but on this level, the situation is the same. The small village becomes a symbol of martyrdom, of guilt, of, uh, of sadness even. Uh, and uh, in our project, in, in fact, there were uh, many more. Uh, uh, so, in the, in local communities uh, which are related to different periods of uh, in, in Polish history, uh, but uh, the common uh, common uh, feature is uh, the um, the clash between the uh, religious uh, thinking of the obligation to the past times and to the dead, and the national thinking, how to commemorate the, uh, and how to build narration on the nation as a whole. Yes, um, you raise very interesting issues in that question. Um, and I don't have a definitive answer for you, but I, I would approach it in different ways. First of all, with Walter Benjamin's famous distinction that communism politicized art and fascism aestheticized politics. I think that even reflects on one or two comments that have, that, that have come from the floor. Um, if we look specifically at did the Soviets manage to invent a new language, well, you'd, I think you'd have to, first of all, break it down a little bit in terms of the r rituals, in terms of secular rituals of marches, speech making, and so forth. And in a sense, they probably did to some extent, but far more interestingly, if you look at the aesthetic level, because you did speak about socialist realism, I think if you periodize this, as a historian, I'm always going to periodize things, um, if we look at the first decade of the revolution, pretty much Stalin solidifies everything after 27, but there is great energy in the first years and to genuinely try to make not only a new man, a new heroism, but also an aesthetic a language and a set of images for this. I saw, I'm sure, Vladimir Mayakovsky there. Uh, the, yeah. Yes, yes, I mean, a figure like Mayakovsky who's genuinely trying to create a new Soviet modernism and so forth. Um, a very good, um, very good authoritative work on this would be Revolutionary Dreams, written by the late Richard Stites, a good friend of ours. Um, in which he goes through the early years of the revolution and what the, the serious challenges that were made before the, the cynicism of Stalin sets in in 27. Some of the innovations were, for instance, the banishing of the word spasiba, because it had a reference to God in it. It didn't eventually work, of course, spasiba stayed in, in, in the Russian language, uh, irrespective of the Soviets. Another very interesting innovation artistically was the uh, a wonderful gesture of democracy that did not work, was the removal of the conductor from the orchestra. Because you couldn't have a single figure conducting an orchestra because that was, if you like, dictatorship or personality cult. Therefore, you had to remove the dictator, you had to remove, sorry, inadvertent, you had to remove the conductor. And somehow the orchestra would, would democratically sort of <laughs> vote for itself as to what key they were going to play. And of course, it was a failure. And the most authoritative figures in the modern world are conductors. Um, but I, I don't have beyond that um, a really conclusive comment. I mean, what eventually what we settle for are the horrors of socialist realism, a, an utterly bland, emptied, predictable aesthetic value. Um, that wasn't inevitable. I mean, I'm just thinking you have, of course, a gift from Stalin right here in, in Warsaw, um, the Palace of Culture. I don't think it was inevitable. But um, there was, I think, genuine efforts in the earlier years of the revolution to create something new in that sense. Um, unfortunately, it, it failed, and Spasiba stayed in the Russian language. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, the, the immortal regiment, the, the commemorative practice that the question was about. So for those who, who don't, probably not everybody knows what immortal regiment is. It's, uh, uh, the, there was an initiative uh, developed uh, some four or five years ago in the civil society, actually. Uh, and the, the 
it consists in uh, people marching along streets of Russia's cities, holding portraits of their relatives, ancestors killed during uh, World War II, or even if not killed, fought due, who fought during uh, World War II. So, about religious symbolism, uh, yes, you could find uh, elements of religious symbolism in this practice, as well as elements of a military parade. So, it's a, it's a some some in some strange way a, a, a unity of military parade and religious procession that we can uh, I don't know see in this uh, in this commemorative practice what is more interesting for me though is that the immortal regiment was the initiative that was like I said public and it was later appropriated by the state in a strangely similar way the Russian Orthodox, uh, the, the, the Orthodox Rus My History, the project that I was talking about today, was developed within the Russian Orthodox Church and later was turned into a state project, was made a state project, appropriated by the state. Well, at least this is my understanding of, of the way the, the situation with this project developed. And um, this, this way, the Russian state appropriates all kinds of uh, memory projects that seem uh, to fit in, in, in the politics of memory that the, the, the attempt is to build. This is what I interests me the most uh, in this case. And to conclude, uh, Tatiana uh, yesterday spoke about the consecration of the Church of New Martyrs and Confessors of Russia in Moscow in Lubyanka. So the religious believers who partook in, in the ceremony, in this consecration ceremony, uh, they were holding, many of them, were holding portraits of uh, new martyrs, uh, people who suffered for the faith, in the very same manner that participants of immortal regiment hold portraits of their deceased uh, relatives, deceased during World War II. So there is this very interesting flow of ideas uh, from one segment of, uh, of Russian society into another, and I cannot say whether it is religious becoming secular or secular becoming religious, or I think it's both, actually. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, everyone. And we don't have time for other questions, but uh, you can uh, speak to our speakers uh, during the lunch. And um, yeah, let's uh, all thank uh, our speakers, and uh, thank you all.